Dynamic Casimir effect is actually a little bit, the name is a little bit of an oddity. Um, there is the so-called static Casimir effect, which is the Casimir effect. If you have two plates which are very close together, there is basically not as much vacuum fitting in there as outside. And so there is an effective pressure on this plate or an effective force that presses them together. The name was chosen because it, initially people thought, oh, this is something similar. It's actually a completely different effect. So the dynamic Casimir effect consists also, you also have two plates or two mirrors, for example, a laser cavity or something like that. And usually if you have a laser cavity, there are certain wavelengths which fit into this laser cavity very nicely and others which don't. The ones that fit in there, they are the ones that, for example, if it's a laser cavity that give you the laser light or so, the others are just not present. So since that depends on the length of this cavity, obviously this frequency changes if you change the length of the cavity. However, um, if you do this change, not very nice and slowly, but if you change that very fast, basically of the same order of magnitude as a light wave oscillate back and forth, suddenly the effect is very different because the light wave that can't even keep up with, with such a fastly moving mirror. So what happens is actually that suddenly um, light is created out of nothing just by moving this mirror very fast. Somewhat counterintuitively, the light that you create is actually half the frequency of the frequency of this of this moving mirror. And this is in principle an, a nice theoretical effect. It basically hasn't really been seen yet, at least not in the pure form experimentally. The thing is now, of course, you can use all kind of tricks. Moving a mirror as fast as a light wave, forget it. This is not, never going to happen. This is way too, way too much energy that you would need. But you can do other things. For example, instead of actually changing the length of this cavity, you can change the length of the so-called effective cavity. Namely, you have an instead of vacuum inside, you have a material in there with an index of refraction. And what the index of refraction does, it effectively changes the wavelengths in there. So it, it changes the effective length of the, of the cavity, even though, if you, if, even though you don't do anything to the mirrors. So now, instead of ch actually changing the mirrors, you can change the index of refraction very fast in there. And this is still very, very hard, but it's much easier than moving the mirror so fast. And um, there are several variations of that. The easiest is if you put one or a couple of atoms or, or um, for example, squids or something like that in the cavity to change this, to change this index of refraction. And there have been lately some experiments which kind of have succeeded with this. However, there has been another um, um, development in the last um, few years, perhaps starting 2005, I would say this is when this first started become a bit bigger, which is called optomechanics or nano-optomechanics. And the idea of that is that you have something like your mirror only just really miniaturized. So a really kind of cantilever, nano cantilever, which is just a few nanometers big, or a very thin and very small membrane, again, of the order of nanometers, so that it basically doesn't have any mass, which now can be, can be moved back and forth by magnetic forces or mechanical forces or so. And because that is so small, that moves a lot faster. Traditionally, the, the idea of optomechanics actually goes the other way around. So you look what does the light field do to your cantilever or membrane. However, this is the obvious system that, that would be interesting for the dynamic Casimir effect, because now you have basically your second mirror replaced by something which potentially can move that fast. There is a lot of research going on as a sideline of this optomechanics into trying to, to get this dynamic Casimir effect um, experimentally with optomechanics. 
So originally the, the idea of the dynamic Casimir effect was a few decades ago. I think people understood right away that this is not an experiment which they can just go in the lab and do. So serious experimental attempts for that have been done certainly only, I would say, after the 2000s. So far, there is really no experimental evidence which really very cleanly shows this dynamic Casimir effect. Because this, this is just, I mean, the, the, the experimental regime principle, people would call it crazy. Okay, the idea is not crazy, but, but the parameters are such that they are just not easily um, available. So you try to use all kinds of tricks. And using optomechanics is basically just one of those tricks. There are basically um, two main problems in measuring that. The one, as I said, it's very, very hard to move anything as fast as a, as a light wave, even if it's not an optical light wave, even if it's only a microwave. It still means that you have to move something of the order of a million times per second or more often. The second, pro the second problem is that even if you can do that, what do you produce? You produce one photon, that means one quantum of the light field, or two, or perhaps three if you are really good. And to measure those is just extremely hard. So imagine you have a macroscopic experimental setup, um, which basically has mirrors on both sides. And now you have to have a detector, which is usually somewhere outside of the cavity, and have to make sure that you somehow measure if there are two quanta of light somewhere showing in, up inside the cavity. So even if people try that, and even if people measure that, usually the, the noise from the environment is considerably higher than that. And this is, these two, or the combination of these two problems is the main reason that there is no really convincing evidence that, that this clean form of the, or original form of the dynamic Casimir effect works. So why is that significant? Why are people interested in that? I haven't been in physics. I was actually not even born when people were first thinking about this. But the idea to make light basically out of vacuum or out of just shaking the vacuum around a bit was just so intriguing. It was really something which looked magical. And to be honest, it's still, even after, after many decades of research and coming much closer experimentally, it still looks like magic. If you don't think about quantum mechanics, etc., it looks like magic. You, there's no light and suddenly there is anything without having anything electric or magnetic or so there. But it is even from a quantum mechanic point of view, it is somewhat magic. Especially if you look at the typical way how optomechanics is described. The equations that describe optomechanics, if you look closely at them, you, you see this nice this term which couples the, the movement of the mirrors and the, the light field in the cavity. And if you look a little bit closer, then you see that no matter what you do, there are all kind of things that can happen to the movement to the, of the mirrors in this interaction, but the photons will be always the same. Okay, so there is nothing in this in this physical mathematical description which would actually produce photons, which means that we actually have to get a step further. Why and where? In which direction does going further mean in this case? <clears throat> the point is, if you look at at orders of magnitude at, at how strongly do you have to move the mirror and how fast, etc. You see that the actual movement of the mirror, really the kind of speed with which it moves to compared to the background, has to be, is actually in the so-called relativistic regime. So the speed of the mirror over the speed of light sh should not be too, too small. <laughs> Usually these, these terms, that is velocity over speed of light, we just neglect them because they are so very small, they are completely insignificant. But this whole dynamic Casimir effect is actually such an effect which is relativistic. And these relativistic terms now have to be reintroduced into the usual description of the optomechanics. So what is, what is the, the near future of this, of trying to find this theoretically, experimentally? Um, so the first experiment actually have been done where a dynamic Casimir effect has been seen in optomechanics, but they don't really create photons out of nothing. They create 
a different wavelengths of photons out of a of of a higher or lower energy, where usually that shouldn't be possible. The magic is not quite as convincing as if the photons would come out of nothing, but it's a first step. What needs to be done? Why is it more difficult to, to create them out of nothing? Um, in that case, you really you need to improve your apparatus, and in particular, you need to um, improve the movement of your mirror, of your membrane, of your cantilever. So you have to make this smaller, you have it made better controllable, you have to have all kind of dissipation, so whatever stops this movement from going on forever. You have to make your cavity better so that your, that your photons don't just go every which way. And this is really a gradual improvement. Um, my expectation is that, let's say, until 2015, 2016, probably all the apparatus is good enough that you actually can see these photons out of nothing. <laughs>